in one second, the sun produces more energy than humankind has used in all of its history. The largest immediate release of energy that we people have managed to contrive was the nuclear weapon known as Tsar Bomba, the biggest nuclear weapon detonated on Earth. Every second, there is the amount of energy that equals two billion Tsar Bombas released from the sun. And I can't help but think that God has created the sun and put it in our daily view just to remind us of that fact, the discrepancy between what energy and power we can produce and the energy that God produces every second <laughs> by the sun that he created without our help at all. And yet, there is one source of power on earth greater than the sun, and it is called faith. Jesus once told his disciples, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. As we speak this morning, our next door neighbors have been bringing in dirt load upon dirt load with dump trucks to flatten out their backyard. Dump truck after dump truck, it's a lot of work. And what Jesus says is that in faith, there is enough power to take all of the stone and rubble and dirt that comprise an entire mountain and in an immediate act to have it cast into the sea. Why is faith so powerful? Faith is not powerful in itself. Some people have wrongly thought this, and you do see this quite a lot in the culture, that as if the mere act of believing something really hard will bring that to pass, the power of positive thinking. That is not what Jesus taught. Faith is not powerful in itself. The reason faith is so powerful is because it connects us to God. It brings to bear God's unlimited power in our lives. That's all faith does. So let me ask, how much more power is there in God every second than is emitted from the sun? <laughs> Infinitely more. And faith brings all that power behind you in your favor. It can't be measured. If you or I had the ability to harness the power of the sun, even for one second, we would fuel the rest of civilization. But in some sense, not to speak too boldly, faith doesn't harness but brings to our side the unlimited power of God. You can do better than harnessing the power of the sun. This is why when David in the Old Testament stood there bold in the valley of Elah, him armorless with nothing but five smooth stones and a sling, felt no fear in the face of the Philistine giant who came taunting him, who had been a warrior since David's youth, who if we thought only on a human plane, the Philistine giant would in fact feed David to the birds, no doubt about it. But the one thing that David had that the Philistine didn't, it wasn't armor and it wasn't weaponry, it wasn't might and strength and training, the one thing David had was faith, the power of the sun, and more than the power of the sun on his side. That's why he could say in that valley, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. David could stand boldly there because he wasn't just reckoning with a human reckoning. He knew there was a force at play in that valley beyond anything human. And it was two billion Tsar Bombas worth of force and more. And it was on his side. So that one smooth stone could be driven into the forehead of the giant and that would be the end of him. It wasn't David's strength. It wasn't David's doing. It wasn't ultimately even David's faith. It was the fact that David by faith had the power of God on his side and therefore could have killed any number of Philistine giants. Worlds melt before this kind of divine power. 
And you, this morning, are facing trials. Some of you are facing temptations that have been temptations maybe the course of your whole life. And you begin to wonder if you'll ever overcome them. Because they have so often overcome you. Or you are in a dark hole of despair and discouragement and you think it impossible that your life could ever be different than that, that you could ever emerge from the shadows that you're submerged in. Listen, you can't. How about two billion Tsar Bombas? How about the power of an infinite number of suns? Faith is what connects us to that kind of power. So that there is no sin and no temptation in your life and it doesn't matter how tenacious it's been in the past. There's no trial that you're engaged in presently that can overcome you. But instead, faith overcomes everything that the world can throw at it. That is the key message in these few verses here in 1 John. So let me read that to you. Chapter 5, we're in verses 3 through 5. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We are nearly at the end of this precious letter. We're in the last chapter. In some sense, John is, this is a metaphor he wouldn't have understood, but he is landing the plane for us. And we've been seeing in this letter how he cycled through three key concepts that are all evidences that you're a true believer. Righteousness, do you live a righteous life? Love, do you love believers? And then here, truth. Do you confess Jesus Christ according to the truth, who he really is, and not some heretical concept of him? And as John's landing the plane, he's going to review all of that, like a good teacher like Wick would do. He's going to review all of these three things at the very end, but as he's landing the plane, he's turning his attention primarily, although love and obedience are here, his focus becomes primarily on truth. This is the last word that John will have for us. Not just the truth, but you believing the truth. The truth does nothing by itself in your life without faith attaching you to it, faith focusing on it. So even here, he's going to mention The love of God, that's our love for God. That's been a key theme. He's going to mention obedience, righteousness. We've considered that. But he's going to sum those up in faith. He's going to, if you will, dig underneath those and say that if you have faith, those will be fulfilled in your life. So we're going to focus today on faith, what it is. That's where we'll start. And then secondly, faith's power what it does in our life when we have it. So let's begin with faith itself, what it is, which is obviously an important question because we want to move out of just the abstract. Everyone in America has faith. Even unbelievers have faith in something. So what kind of faith is John talking about in this passage that if you have it, God's power is on your side? For the answer, we have to start at the end of our text. So look down in verse 5 to begin. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That question of overcoming the world, we're going to hit pause on that. We're going to return to it when we consider faith's power. That's what faith does. But let's just consider the believing itself as it's presented to us in this text. Who is the victor? And he asked this as a question. Who overcomes? Verse 5. But it's not a question. It is, but it's not. It's rhetorical. You're supposed to answer in keeping with the question, saying, yes, that's exactly who overcomes the world. Who is it? The one who believes. And it's not a period after that. The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 
This is one of the most important points when we consider biblical, true Christian faith, as opposed to everything else that you'll find in the world. It is this. True biblical faith has Jesus Christ as its object. True biblical faith is a looking, and it's not much more than that. It's just a looking, but it is a looking at Jesus Christ. It is the one in our text who believes that, and then something about Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the object. He's the focus here of this faith. We don't want to overcomplicate things. It is a looking at Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. If you know the London preacher of the last century, two centuries ago now, Charles Spurgeon, one of my heroes of the faith, when he was a very young man, before he came to know Christ, he was wandering. It was a snowstorm. He couldn't get to the church he usually attended. He stops by at a primitive Methodist church. He goes in there. There are not many people. He's very conspicuous. He sits in the back. He's a youth of 15 or 16 years of age. And the man is preaching. It's not even the regular preacher. He's stuck at home in the snowstorm. It's some common person gets up there, not well-versed. Spurgeon said he stuck very close to his text for the simple reason he had not much else to say. (laughs) But thankfully, the text he stuck to was this from Isaiah. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And that homely preacher emphasized, look. Now Spurgeon, the young man at this point, had gone church to church, person to person, Christian to Christian, trying to relieve himself of the guilt of his sin. He felt it like a burden. And one preacher told him, try harder to obey God. (laughs) He said, I tried, but I couldn't. And he went and he went and he went and he couldn't do it. And this homely man standing in the pulpit, perhaps a cobbler of shoes, is saying, look at my text. Look unto me and be saved. Look to Christ. And the man says, looking's not doing. Looking's just looking. (laughs) And then he, very unusually for Spurgeon, took him by surprise. The man looks down and sees young Spurgeon. Says, young man, you look miserable. (laughs) Spurgeon said, I did. I just wasn't used to people telling that to me from the pulpit. And he said, young man, Look to Christ. And then, Spurgeon said, in a way only a primitive Methodist at that time could, the man raised his arms and said, Look! 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 And in that moment, Spurgeon looked. He didn't stand from his seat. He didn't fidget hands. He didn't perform an act. He didn't participate in mass. He didn't do anything. What did he do? He looked. Later in life, Spurgeon would recall that moment with these words. I had been waiting to do 50 things, but when I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could almost have looked my eyes away. There and then the cloud was gone, the darkness had rolled away, and that moment I saw the sun And I could have risen that instant and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to Him. That's faith. Not doing, it is looking. And notice, it's not just looking anywhere, it is looking to Jesus Christ. So in our text, Who overcomes the world? It has to be the one who believes, not does, not acts, not the strong in the world. No, the one who believes what? Believes the truth about who Jesus Christ is. The one who has a looking faith, a looking of the heart toward Christ as he is revealed in Scripture. That's faith. That is the essence of faith. There is a content to our belief. There is a set of things we have to believe, even here in the text, who believes that, something about Jesus. But even the content that we believe is all centered around Jesus Christ. We believe the Word of God for various reasons, but among them, for this reason, that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, believes the Word of God, quoted the Old Testament. Everything we believe even about Christ, turns our focus to Christ. 
Even when our faith, which at times must be directed towards something we are praying for, something we want to see God do in our life, and that's appropriate, but even when we direct our faith there, it is never directly there. It is still a faith focused on Christ, begging Him in His power to do it. Do you remember those two blind men who were brought before Jesus? And Jesus asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Sorry, he asked them in this case, do you believe that I am able to do this? Meaning to heal their eyes. And their reply was, yes, Lord. And so he said, according to your faith, be it done to you. Many people, as I have said, have tried to take that last line, according to your faith, be it done to you. Rip it out of the Bible and create some kind of positivity, self-help, name it and claim it mentality. That is not at all what Jesus is saying here. His question was, do you believe that I am able to do this? The focus is upon Jesus and their response is, yes, Lord. Submission to his lordship, yes, you can do this. Even though it was focused on something they wanted Christ to do, our prayers of faith, even for things that we want to see happen, are ultimately still essentially focused upon Christ. That's what separates true biblical Christian faith from any other variety of faith you may find in the world. It has as its object Jesus Christ. You may be today like the young Spurgeon. I won't point you out like that preacher did. Looking quite miserable, feeling quite miserable with the weight, the burden of sin. And you're trying to find relief from the burden of your own offenses against God. And perhaps you've tried many things. As Spurgeon said, he did 50 things trying to get rid of his guilt. Then to you, look, <laughs> look. Look to Christ. You can do it this moment. You can do it from your seat. You don't have to stand up. It's not an action. Faith is the turning of the heart toward Jesus Christ. You say, I don't see him. He's invisible. He's in heaven. He's not here. You can't see him here. Your heart can perceive him. Look this moment with the eyes of faith to Jesus Christ. Have him as the object of your inward gaze. And you will be saved. You will be delivered from an eternity of God's just judgment. And made right with God now and forever. And you will overcome the world. Because what's the victory that overcomes the world? It's this. Faith. Our faith. Not doing. Well, it's great to do things. But it's primarily believing. And primarily believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's the first thing to notice about what faith is. It's not a doing. Faith is a looking of the soul to Jesus Christ. He is the object of our attention. Now, working our way backwards in the text, we do learn something else about the nature of faith here. In verse 4, he says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. We would have expected him to say, Everyone who believes, everyone who has faith, has overcome the world. And that's exactly what he does say in the next verse. But notice here, instead of believe, what does he put there? Everyone who has been born of God. The original language actually unusually here has it, everything, everything born of God overcomes the world. To put the emphasis not on us, the ones believing, but on the believing itself. Everyone who has been born of God, or here, everything that has been born of God overcomes the world. John equates the being born of God and the believing. That is, he binds them so close together that he's saying exactly the same thing about both of them. You see that? Who overcomes the world? Well, those who've been born of God. Well, I thought you said it was those who believed. Yes, it's those who believed. I thought it was those who have been born of God, yes, because one cannot be removed from the other. This is the second thing that separates true biblical Christian faith from all the varieties you find in the world, and it is that in John's mind, faith is not an impotent, weak thing. 
It's not just you in your mind mentally assenting to a Sunday school story you heard when you were a child. It's not you simply agreeing with what I say from this pulpit. Are you in your own mind agreeing, assenting to even what you find here in the Bible? In our country, at least, and in many so-called Christian countries, most people in the population mentally assent to the basic facts about Christianity. Even in our text, that Jesus is the Son of God. You could ask most people and they would believe that. But notice that when John speaks of this belief, he equates it with being born of God. This rebirth, this being born of God as we've seen in John, is a complete change of you at your innermost core. This blows out of the water the theory that faith is nothing but mental assent. Faith for John is a powerful thing. You who truly exercise the gaze of the soul toward Christ, it's instantaneous. You look to him, but when you do, you are born of God. You are not what you were before you believed in Jesus Christ. There is a definitive change that happens. James will prove this to you, Jesus' half-brother, when he says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The demons offer a mental assent to every truth of the gospel. They know it better than you do. You may remember that in Jesus' own lifetime, while his disciples, those closest to him, were stumbling over themselves trying to believe and understand who this rabbi was, the demons were miles ahead of them. In fact, the clearest, most certain, and consistent confessions of the truth about Jesus in the Gospels came not from any person, not from Jesus' followers, came from demons. Such as the time when the demons said to Jesus, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? (laughs) At a time when no one else was calling Jesus the Son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Demons mentally assent that Jesus is the Son of God. And even the devil, when he tempted Jesus and said, if you are the Son of God, he knew. So faith cannot be mere mental agreement that Jesus is the Son of God. Because mere mental agreement does not in itself result in or come from a being born of God. Demons are not born of God. And you don't have to be born of God to mentally agree with the statements in this letter about Jesus. Faith, therefore, in its nature, it is an inward gazing of the soul at Jesus. It is only a looking. It is not a doing. But it's real. It's not just your imagination. It's not just you pretending something. Faith is a reality, and when you have it, you'll see the reality because you'll be changed at your innermost being, and you will be different. It's a real thing. Mental assent by itself, while necessary to true faith, is just the minimum requirement. Of course, you have to believe these things mentally. You have to agree. You have to know them and agree with them. But once you've reached there, you've only reached the level of demons. You then have to trust Trust, throw yourself, gaze in a way that looks nowhere else. It looks only at Jesus Christ. That is true biblical faith, and it causes a change within you, so much so that he can say, those who overcome the world are those who have been born of God. To believe is to be born of God. To be born of God, you believe. The two have to go together for it to be true faith. So that is the nature of faith as we find it in our text. But the rest of our text is focused on if you have that, what can you expect in your life? And it's rather amazing. We move now from faith to faith's power. So see verses 3 and 4 again. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 
As with much of John's letter, there's some logic to be untangled here. So bear with me a moment. Start, for example, with this four, right at the start in verse three. The four points you back to the verse previous, that's verse two. And in verse two, John had attached our love for God and our obedience to God's commandments. You remember that? By this we know that we love the children of God when we, number one, love God, number two, obey his commandments. And in case anyone thinks those don't go together, loving God and keeping rules, now he explains why those do go together. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. In other words, those who truly love God, their love for him will definitely show itself in the keeping of his commandments, not perfectly, but characteristically. That, that will lead to this. Now, that's not new in this letter. John has been urging us to keep God's commandments, to live a righteous life, to walk in the light, to be obedient. But what he's doing in our text is digging underneath the obedience. Obey, but he's digging underneath and he's saying, you will obey if you love God. Because that's what the love of God leads to. He says, basically, that's what it is. <laughs> there is more to it. There's affection. There's warmth. But he's just saying they're so closely connected. If you love God, you will obey his commandments. That's underneath obedience. This is just like what Jesus said in his lifetime. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And yet the thing is that in this world, every one of us who know Christ, we do love God but we don't perfectly keep his commandments. We wish it were true. We wish that we did. We wish that we perfectly loved God and perfectly kept his commandments. But do you know that in your own life, for some of you, you get home around your family and you speak rashly. Your emotions get ignited. Maybe it's just one member of the family or it could be all. And you go off like that, you say things, and you immediately regret them. And when you've calmed down, you think, what have I done? You go, you ask forgiveness, but the next day, it happens again. What's going on? You love God. You love God. You want to put to death this sin in yourself. But boy, it persists. With others, it may be sexual temptation, the desire for marriage if you're single, or any number of things that you're craving. They've become idols in your life, and you feel like when you reach a spiritual high, you topple that idol over, and it just stands itself right back up in your heart. The next week, how many times have you descended the stairway to death as sexual temptation calls again like the woman at the beginning of Proverbs? You may feel that the commandments of God are good. You love God. You want to keep His commandments. They're good, and you continue to fail at keeping them. And now you get to the place where you think, God's commandments are crushing. I look at them. I can't keep them. I fail over and over. You feel like His commandments become a great burden. That's because you've not yet factored in faith. When you factor in faith, true Christian biblical faith, the commandments are not burdensome. You say, well, they feel burdensome. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong, and I can prove it to you. Look right here in our text, verse 3. And his commandments are not burdensome. Gotcha. I win that one. But they feel burdensome. Well, look at the logic of the text that we're still unpacking here. Look right after. For, they're not burdensome. For, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That's why they're not burdensome. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. So there is the world. It is the sum of all the temptations that you experience. It is the remaining flesh in you in some sense. And it is this great big world, this cosmic system, the demons, the devil himself, working together with all under his sway to stir up in you your sin, to get you to disbelieve the goodness of God 
and everything in this world is working against you. It's like the bully named the world stands up in the cafeteria and pushes you to the ground and you get up and pushes you to the ground again. And you're so weak, you can't stand up to him. But faith is what brings Jesus to your side <laughs> to push the bully on the ground. <laughs> it's not your strength. Faith is you saying, Jesus, a little help here. It's you calling out to him. It's you turning your attention to him. This is our victory over the world. That includes your sins, your temptations. That includes troubles that you find in this world, persecutions, the things that lead you to doubt the goodness of God, your trial, your hard circumstances. You can conquer it all. You can overcome it all. Yet not you, but Christ in you by faith. This is the victory that overcomes the whole world. It is our faith. So if you are here and you feel, which we all do at times, let's be honest, and you feel like the commandments of God, don't look at that. That's sexual sin. Turn your eyes away. Don't entertain those thoughts. Don't seek money and advancement in your career at the expense of your family. Don't do it. Don't take in their praise and get a big head. Don't be proud. Don't want that. Even Christian service, don't do it for your own glory. Don't use your tongue that way. Don't treat your family that way. Don't explode again. Don't simmer. No cold shoulder. Stop. You go, it feels burdensome until faith becomes a factor. Faith takes all that, conquers it. Like Alexander in the ancient world. Like Napoleon comes and conquers. That's the word that's used here, nikao. It is a conquering, an overcoming. It's a victory, meaning a conquering of a foe. And the foe is the world. And the way we conquer all that the world tempts us with, all disobedience, the way we keep God's commandments is not by our own grit. It is by faith. That is our victory. So if you're here and you say, well, the commandments do seem burdensome, there may be a few reasons that the commandments seem burdensome for you. All of them are solved by faith. I'll just give you some examples. For example, it might be that you have put upon yourself more commandments than God puts upon you. Or even just different commandments from the ones God puts upon you. So you remember at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 that Peter stood up as they debated, should these Gentiles be required to keep all the external regulations of the Old Testament Mosaic law, including circumcision? And Peter said that those external regulations, trying to abide by those, was, quote, a yoke on the neck that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Christ fulfilled the old covenant, all of its regulations. Every moral precept, everything the Old Testament in law or narrative reveals about God's unchanging nature and his expectations for us, those abide forever. Those are his commandments. They're given to us clearly in the New Testament. But the regulations, the external dietary restrictions, all of the commandments that have to do with what you touch and don't touch, what kind of seed you sow or don't, what kind of clothes you wear, all of those external regulative commandments of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ as a perfect Jewish man fulfilled for us. So that like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he could say, I myself am not under the law. But then he said, but I'm not apart from the law because I'm under the law of Christ. I'm not under the external regulations of the Mosaic law, but I am under the law of Christ, meaning from the heart I obey every command of Christ in this new covenant of which we are a part. Now you might say, how does that relate to me? Well, see, even in Jesus' day, all of the earliest Christians had a very difficult time pushing past the external regulations as required for Christianity. Because they'd grown up with it, the dietary restrictions. This is why Jesus, when he started to reveal this to Peter, 
brought in a vision a sheet down to Peter on the rooftop, and the sheet had unclean animals. Old Testament regulations forbade the eating of these animals. And three times from heaven came the voice, Peter, get up, kill, eat these. And Peter said, I can't do it. I've never done it. I can't do it. And the sheet came down a second time. Peter, eat these. I won't. A third time. Eat them. <laughs> no. He was used to the external restraints and regulations required under the old covenant. God had purposes for those. But now it was made clear that there was a new covenant. The Old Testament regulations were fulfilled in Jesus Christ so that Gentiles could be brought into the church, Gentiles like us, without having to be circumcised, keep the dietary restrictions, and keep the ceremonial and the civil regulations of the Old Covenant. And there's a lot of them. If you've read Exodus, if you've read the Pentateuch and the Old Testament, there are a lot of them. You might not be tempted, some are, but you might not be someone who is tempted thinking, I need to keep the Old Testament festivals and regulations and dietary restrictions. But there is a human principle, a human dynamic that goes beyond those who are in those Jewish circles struggling with the loss of those Jewish regulations. And it is that for all of us, it is easy to make a checklist of purely external actions that you do and set those up as, if I keep these external actions, check, 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 then God loves me. If I'm in the Word this amount of time in the morning, and if I pray fervently for this long for this many people, and if I'm at these number of Christian events, check. If I've memorized this number of verses, check. If I've had all good social interactions with lost people to beautify the gospel for them, check. If I've done these external things, then God favors me. If you have that attitude, check, 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 check. On the one hand, you might think, oh, that will make life so easy if I could just have a checklist of what to do. <laughs> that might be what's crushing you. That might be why you feel like the commandments of God are burdensome. Because you know what's lacking in your checklist? Faith. You don't need faith to do your checklist. You could take a lost person out there with zero faith and they could do your checklist. They could do it better than you. <laughs> there are Muslims, Hindus, devout, who are more disciplined than you are, and they check off more boxes than you do, but you know what they don't have? They don't have faith in Jesus Christ. If you feel that when you read this verse, his commandments are not burdensome, and you go, that doesn't make any sense to me. They certainly feel burdensome. It might be that your commandments feel burdensome. Faith. God doesn't promise to give you the grace and the faith and the strength to keep your commandments. But he does promise to give you the strength through faith to keep his commandments. That's why they're not burdensome. The solution to this is faith. How do you overcome this checklist mentality? It is a faith that believes that before you even open the book with the checklist in it, you are justified simply by looking to Jesus Christ. You already have God's favor. This is what we call justification by faith alone. It's not by what you do. It's not justification by checklist, but it's justification by faith alone. Let Christ be the one who did the work for your salvation. Don't try to steal that glory. The cross is enough. He said it's finished. You say, wait, wait, I got one more thing I'm going to add to it. No, justification by faith alone. But you see... This is easier in that it makes the commandments of God less burdensome. Love God, love others. You're zealous to keep His commandments because faith is compelling you, so it's easier in that regard. But it's harder because you can't see it. If you live your life by faith, you don't get to the end of the day with a checklist you can look at and go, yes, God loves me. You can only know God loves you because you believe it. No confirmation. You believe it by faith. But if you do, that faith will compel you to keep God's commandments. They will not be burdensome. It will overcome them. Now, that might not be your circumstance, and you say, I still feel the commandments of God are burdensome. 
Maybe it's not that you've added any commandments to them, but you're thinking of just the real legitimate commandments of Scripture. Love your neighbor, love believers, love others, live a pure life, abstain from sexual immorality, love your husband, love your wife, love your children, raise them up in the fear of the Lord. All the New Testament commandments. You're thinking of those, but they're burdensome because you just feel like you can't keep them. You try, but it's your flesh that remains that, ugh, It's hard to obey the actual commandments. So what's the solution for that? This might surprise you. Faith. If you believe that Christ is who he says he is, has done what he has said he has done, and your eyes are fixed on him, you will throw off the sense of burden when it comes to the commands of God. You will overcome the whole world. If your eyes remain fixed upon him, like Peter on the waves, when your eyes are on Jesus, you can walk on water. Now, you can't do that by yourself. But with faith, looking at Jesus, you're putting off sins that you thought you'd never put off. Then you get distracted and you sink right into them. So what's the solution? Jesus grabs you, pulls you back up. Look at me. (laughs) Look at Jesus. It's faith. It's not Peter. Pump your legs harder. (laughs) Try harder. It's keep your focus on me faith. John Owen wrote the famous book on the mortification of sin. Highly recommend you can go read that. But he wrote that book because in his day there were so many manuals on how to fight your sin that were just try harder. He said, no, it's by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you overcome your sin. There is a good picture of this in the Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read that, where the interpreter leads Christian, the pilgrim, into a room and shows him a room that is full of dust all over the floor The interpreter says to a man by the side, take that broom and sweep this dust up. But when the man comes to sweep up the dust, all it does is spread it into the air, clogs the air. The dust will not be tamed. So then the interpreter says to a maiden who stands nearby, take some water and sprinkle it everywhere on the dust. And she does. Then they sweep it and it's easily swept and thrown away. And the interpreter explains to Christian, that dust is your sin. And that broom, that man who comes in to sweep it, that's the law. That's, those are the commandments when you don't know Christ. That law comes in and says, do, don't do, do, don't do. But the more commandments you get outside of Christ, apart from faith, the more it simply stirs up the sin that's in you. It just makes you sin more. Don't put your hand in the cookie jar. And now you will. That's the way commandments work when there's no faith present. But then the water, the interpreter explains, the woman with the water, she brings the gospel. And it is faith in the gospel that settles the sin down so by the power of God it can be dealt with. It has to be by faith. You have to deal with your sins by faith. If you're feeling God's commandments burdensome, they are painful at times. They are difficult, no doubt. They are not burdensome. And when you feel them burdensome, return to looking at Jesus Christ. The only way to overcome your sin and the whole world is by this victory. It is our faith. There is not another way. But by faith you can. This is why we do not focus here on new strategies for church growth and personal growth. Fads that come up, and they do come up. Some advice is good, but Despite what the clickbait says, there are not eight simple steps to kill all your sin. (laughs) It is faith. There may be counsel. There may be advice. Seek advice from those older. How am I going to fight this temptation? Good. But at the end of the day, to really put it to death, it will be by faith. It will be you looking away from the sin to Christ, and the sin dies away. It's the only way. To have lasting success over our temptations. If you are fighting your sin and Jesus Christ isn't a part of the picture, even if you win, you lose. Turn your gaze upon Jesus Christ and you then have the power of a thousand sons behind you. You cannot kill your sin or endure your trial or love the people in your life with anything less than the power of a thousand sons, knowing who you are and how difficult this life can be. But that is exactly what comes to your aid when your gaze is upon Jesus Christ. When you are looking at Him, 
There is no nuclear weapon stronger than the power, the resurrection power that is in your life to kill your sin, to help you to love others. Think of your sins and temptations. Do you believe that they can be conquered? Jesus points at them and says, do you believe I can do this for you? If you say yes, Lord, he says, according to your faith, may it be done for you.